Jeff, that was very inspiring. But you know, I'm going back to my school and trying to be a ten teacher in my classroom. Um, that poses a huge threat to my maybe to my principal, maybe to my colleagues. H how do you deal with that resistance? Well, I think you know I look. What I've learned over the years is the same things that work with kids work with grown-ups. Okay. Okay. So you know. I get that question all the time and, and usually what I ask them is, is I say, have you ever taught before? Right? And they say, yeah. And I say, did you ever have a kid resist? Right? And they say, yeah. And I say, well, what did you do? Right? And they almost always talk about those three things that I just laid out. Right? They say, well, I, I started building a relationship with them and I started, and so I said, well, you already know the answer to the question you're asking me. You just don't like the answer. Because when you talk about building relationships with children, right, that's what most people signed up to do. Yeah, right. So I go with when, that. When you're the authority figure. Right. But it's different when you're dealing with peers and with your authority right. figure. Right, right. But the same thing that worked with that child works with other grown-ups. What, what they're threatened by okay, is not actually what you're doing because they actually want to do it too. Right? The things that I just talked sure. about, the overwhelming majority of people want to have those kind of relationships right. with kids. Right. Right? They want kids to be able to talk deeply about what's hurting them right? and feel like you will be there to hold them, right? to move them through that. But the true, the, the, the true resistor right, is largely internal. Yes, and the external pressures that you're feeling which cause you to react. There's always external pressures, right? right? There's, there's external pressures no matter what you're talking about doing, right? But if the work, if you're true to Except the work. Co complying, even, then, then you're satisfying the external well, pressures. But, but even, even around compliance, right? There's, there's pressures to be compliant, to right, continue right, to be right, compliant, right. to be compliant to the latest thing, yeah. right? Um, and and what, um, what feels heavy is when you're complying with something that you don't really believe in, right? What is actually liberating is taking that first step to doing what you actually believe in, right? And when, when people press back around it, right? Instead of seeing that as an attack or seeing that as a threat, right? Being able to find their humanity in that pushback. I'm a school principal, I'm exhausted, I'm working incredible hours, I've got troubles, unimaginable troubles. I'm doing everything I can to stay on top of the thing so it doesn't feel like it's going to blow up. How do, how do I make time for this? How do I create space today? I don't mean in the long run. I mean, what do I do tomorrow? Yeah. I mean, look, um, my mom used to tell me a story about how she said that there's going to be a time in your life where you are dropped in the middle of the ocean. And there's you got no compass point, okay? So you, there's no you can't eyeball land anywhere. Yeah. And at that point, you have two choices. You can tread water, and if you tread water, you will drown. It's inevitable. Right. Or you can swim, and you may start swimming deeper out, right? There may be another direction you can go that's closer to land, right? But that is the only way that you have a shot to not drown. Right? So I think people, they, they, want, they want it packaged in a way where it's right. like, you know, if X, then Y, right? And it's not like that, right? And if you've ever taught, you understand that, right? Mm. It's not like that. You have to start somewhere, okay? So if we were talking about those three, I would say start with relationships, right? Start, make a commitment that this year, right, we're gonna focus heavily on getting community input, and really improving how the community scores us, rates us, evaluates us on relationships. If I'm a teacher, what conversation do I have with my principal to give me the space to do that? Or do I just do it and not ask permission? Yeah, I, I mean, it varies case to case, right? I think most principals, like the overwhelming majority of principals, want teachers to have really good relationships with kids. Because that makes the principal's job easier, yeah. right? Then that kid's not getting sent out of class, right? They don't have to suspend. They don't, kids are more engaged, which means they're doing better in school, right? It's a positive cycle, right? 
but it um, also means changing the current processes. Well, perhaps, right? I think that, look, you can take the existing curriculum that you have, right? I don't care what it is. Holt, Mifflin, Pearson, whatever, yeah. whatever you have, right? And you can build really strong relationships around it, right? So you, so I, you can give me the, the mandated textbook and curriculum, right? And I can create a set of relationships with kids around that curriculum where they're critiquing the curriculum. And then we're bringing in secondary sources, right, to analyze the places where that's not true or that's an incomplete story, right, and rewriting curriculum. And so it, it, it really is about making a decision that you're going to prioritize these things, okay, and trusting. Look, I think, look, the truth of the matter is, is that I think that a fairly decent number of people in this society do not believe that these kids can do it. Yes, and they, they do not want to believe. Well, I think there's a deep-seated, right, racist, classist, yes. right, belief system, okay, um, that, that we all carry by virtue of the fact yes. that we live in this country, we, right? We, we all co-create it. Right, right. So, so get, given that, right, I, I have two choices. I can take this risk with these kids who part of me believes can't do it. And I can take this risk, and then if I'm right, if that deep-seated belief that I hate having, but I just, it's, it's pulling on me, is right, I'm screwed, okay? And so I'm gonna stay compliant. I don't like being compliant with this. I don't really right. believe it. It's right. not the teacher I wanted to be, but it's a safer play, okay? Right. The irony is this, that we are asking the most vulnerable children we are telling them all the time, take risks, be vulnerable. That's how you change the world. We've got Che and Malcolm X and Martin Luther right. King, all these people who did exactly what I'm talking about, right? We name schools after them. But we don't model that behavior. Okay. So how do I protect myself if I'm a principal in a lone wolf or a teacher, a lone wolf from my own security, how do I reduce the risk enough? What kind of tactical things can I do to try to reduce? It's gonna be risky, yeah. you know. What can I do tactically? What can I do tomorrow that will begin to both give me the courage and reduce the risk, maximize yeah. the chance of success? Well, so first of all, I would say, if that's your starting point, you can't do it. Okay. Right? Nobody that has ever fundamentally changed a school, a classroom, ever yeah. has started there. How do I protect myself, right? You must allow yourself to be vulnerable. All the research around empathy shows yeah. that, right? Yeah. That if we're gonna have an empathic relationship, I have to make myself vulnerable to you first, yeah. okay? So that's the first thing. You have to get comfortable in your discomfort. You have to be okay with being vulnerable, right? You have to trust that this community will protect you, right? That you, you don't work for your superintendent. You work for the children and families that serve you. And if, you, if, if you're serving those children and families and the superintendent starts pressing down on you and those families raise up, the superintendent's in trouble, right? But you have to trust, right? People don't trust us. They don't trust our community, right? But everywhere we see this happening and then that person gets pushed back, right? The community rallies around them, right? Because they, they made themselves vulnerable. They took this huge risk. The community always honors that, right? But you have to be okay with that, right? With, with that level of discomfort. Now, what I would say is early in my career, okay, I did it in a way that was, um, that was immature and, uh, and, and not very strategic. It's like too confrontational, too, yeah, too transparent, like, yeah, too exactly. in your face. Right, okay. right. And so what I've learned over the years is um, that, that uh, one, how much relationships matter. Right, um, and two to, to to prepare myself for the critics. You know, one of my mentors is a, a, a really well-known scholar in education. Her name is Jeannie Oates, and Jeannie told me once. She said, "When you write, the problem right now is is that the people that you see over your shoulder are the people who already agree with you." She said, "I want you to change the way that you write so that when you write." that your biggest critics are over your shoulder. And you're hearing them, right? 
as you're speaking to the choir, right, you're hearing them naysay, and then you embed your response to their critique in your base argument. And that's what I've learned over the years, is I already know the critique that's gonna come. So it's my fault if I'm not ready for it, right? So I know the critique's coming, right? And I've equipped myself with, here's the research that I'm yeah. using, right? Here's, here's the strategy, here's how I'm tracking my data, here's how I... And, and going before you said, boy, if you don't like what I'm doing, you're gonna have to deal with 500 angry parents. That's right, right? right. 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 And let, let the community fight that battle for you. You don't have to fight yeah. that battle, right? But if you see yourself as the savior, if you see yourself as the you know, knight in shining armor, right. then you'll take on battles, right? Th that, and you won't win the war. B both battles you shouldn't take them on, and both battles you shouldn't take on and take them on in the wrong way. That's right. Yeah. Right. And, and inevitably, yeah. like you, you lose that war. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, look. So, and, so and, pay pay a lot of attention to your enemies because those are the people who you're really engaging with. Yeah. yeah. And, and and I think that how even how you think about your enemies, yeah. right? That for me, there's a there's a paradigm in this country where you you hear that word and then that is somebody or something you have to destroy. Right. right? That is not no, how no, I see it. No. Right. We, the, what we teach our kids is, is influence your enemies, yeah. right? And they may never agree with you, right? But let them know that you know what you're doing, yeah. right? And they don't have to agree with it and because the, they're not getting the results yeah. that they're telling you to yeah. get anyway. Right. And the, the people who are most upset by what you're doing are also the people most engaged in the work that you're doing. Right? It's the people who are disengaged are much harder, but the people are already in That's right. there. Right? That's, That's right. True. So, kind of one last, what, what would you tell these people to start doing tomorrow? First thing, they go back to school on Monday, what should they do differently? I would say asset map. So, um, you know, another thing my mom used to talk to me all the time about is the, this, the story of the glass half full, glass half empty, right? right. right? Um, and it's both, right? right. Both are true. Yeah. yeah, so it's all about perspective, yeah. right? Your school is a glass half empty and a glass half full. And I find principals spend an inordinate amount of time focused on the half empty side, yeah. right? They never see the assets they have. They never see the, the stuff I just talked about. They have teachers in their building that are already doing it. Yeah. And they're spending all this time with the teachers that aren't, yeah. right? And, and it's exhausting for them, right? And so what I tell them is, is focus on the teachers that are. They will invigorate you. They will make you believe again in the work, right? And through them, right, you'll start getting connected yeah. to other teachers that are ready to go there, right? And you'll start spending less and less time, right, on the teachers who aren't ready yet, yeah. right. right? And you'll feel better every day because you'll have affirmations from your staff because you're you're working in the asset mode. Is that true in the classroom itself too? That the people who are, the kids who are with you are your assets, uh, also as a protection of getting discouraged by the kids who are taking longer on the journey? Yeah, yeah I think that's right. And I think that if you, um, you know, what we, what we work with them on is sort of asset mapping, right, the building or with the teacher asset mapping the classroom, yeah. right? And, and knowing that every single day, right, this group of kids is, is getting a really positive impact yeah. from you, okay? And so that's good. Right, feel good about that, right? Now, with the kids you're struggling with, pick one and win. And then when you win him or her, right, then get him or her to start helping you win with the next one, right? And though that starts falling like dominoes, right? But I think that, look, Socrates said that, that what is worthwhile is always difficult, right? Okay? And so I, I think that people have to begin to find meaning in the mess. Yeah. And, and what, we've, what we've narrated, right, and this is kind of my critique of like the, these, these teacher hero stories, right, that come out, right, is that they never actually really can capture the mess that leads to the meaning. Right. And so there's this notion that really good principals and really good teachers never have conflict. Right. Right? It's just everything is popping in their class. And that is so far from the truth. Right? I have conflict in my classroom all the time. And so getting to the sensibility that love, getting away from this kind of Pollyannish definition of love. 
right? And understanding that love is not the absence of conflict. Right. Love is the presence of conflict with the courage, character, and commitment to find your way through. My, my first marriage broke up because we didn't know how to fight, you know? Right. Uh, absolutely. And learning how to tolerate conflict, but for, particularly for people who's, who are committed to nurturing and helping right. is hard. It's yeah, a hard work. It, it is, but I think what, you know, what we want people to understand is, is, that it, is that you don't have to do it by yourself, right? That's why we built 10. That's why we built the network, right? It's to say that there are principals all over the country that are trying to do this, just like you're trying to do it. So the, the very nature of this work that allows it to be so status quo, right? That, that has allowed the system to maintain its yeah. abject failure for decades is the isolation. So as long as you struggle in isolation, the likelihood that you unravel this ball of yarn and get it back together right. is really, really low, right. right? And there are people, really exceptional committed people who are able to pull that off. But what I've have had the privilege of doing, flying all over the world and seeing some of the world's most talented teachers, some most amazing schools, is what I began to realize is, is that every single problem that a teacher or a principal is struggling with, every single one right now, there is another teacher or principal somewhere in this country that struggled with it and unlocked it. And the fact that those two cannot easily connect is absurd. So we created this network, right, precisely for that reason, to say anything you're struggling with right now, put it into the network. And there's another principal, there's another teacher in the network that's either struggling with that too, so you can struggle in solidarity, right? Or that has said, six months ago I had that same problem, I tried 19 different things, and here's what finally unlocked it yeah. for me. So it's disseminating the learning from other people's experiments. It's about the long haul, not the short haul, and it's not a straight line. That's I'm just trying to repeat back what you're saying. That's right. And there's a one of the things that you said, which I think is really important, is that if you, it, it's that it goes back to the ocean story. If there is some faith involved, you know, if you believe in what you're doing, right. then the courage to step into that ambiguity. That's right. That's right. And if I'm a, if I'm a drown, I'm a drown swimming. Right, rather than a drinking water. Thank you, Jeff. It was great. My Thanks, pleasure. Jeff. Thanks very much.